Welcome to Construction Executives Live. I am your host, Jeremy Owens, owner and founder of U.S. Construction Zone and Three Generations Improvements out in sunny Northern California. I wanted to be clear from something right from the top. We are home of the Sacramento Kings, not the Golden State Warriors. If you happen to be a Warrior fan, you can go ahead and drop off now. Just kidding. Um, welcome. Uh, thanks for being here. I see a lot of uh, familiar names and faces as usual. Um, thank you for, for tuning in. I know a lot of us are getting out of spring break and vacations and getting back to the grind. So welcome back to the grind with me. And thanks for taking some time out of your busy schedules to, uh, to hang out. We have another great, uh, great topic to explore today and also have a couple more uh, platform updates for you as well. Um, I thought I'd share it with you. Uh, so U.S. Construction Zone has opened up a store as well, and I wanted to kind of quickly share that with you. When you go to usconstructionzone.com, you'll see a little link at the top that says shop. What we've done is we've added just construction related apparel um, and what we're going to be adding here in addition to the the things that we use every day like you know job site signs and business cards and hats and shirts and all that stuff that we use every day we're going to be adding products and services as well so um if you have a product or service whether it's an educational platform or whether it's a tech or whether it is an actual product that relates to the construction industry you think it should be in, the, in our store feel free to email me jeremy at usconstructionzone.com um, we're always looking for for new win-wins and partnerships so please don't hesitate to reach out to me um i think the the shop uh, kind of uh, was brought to me with a, a couple requests that hey jeremy you're you're pointing us in the right direction you're showing us you know who to talk to when to talk to to somebody and we also would like to see some products and services there as well and that's why we did it we, we're going to give it a try um it's not really my wheelhouse but it's fun to try new things and that's what we're doing here at U.S. Construction Zone. So thanks so much for checking that out. Um, I would appreciate feedback, too, if you take a look at the site and you have some feedback for me or some additional products and services you feel should be there. Please uh, don't hesitate to let me know. Um, we have a great show for you today called Building Your Ideal Business While Preserving Your Valuable Time. Um, the vast majority of building and remodeling business owners, we invest at least 20, 30 years of our life on the grind and at the end of it we don't have a lot of uh transferable value when we close our doors you know i think often we we get stuck in the weeds we get hyper focused on the day-to-day -day. i know for me personally we're putting out fires some literally and the day-to-day -day tends to distract us from the strategic aspects of our business and we need to put some more thought into that and with this live show, we're going to learn how to unlock our visionary potential with a great guest, um, Dwayne Johns. And he entered the construction industry oh, 30 years ago, it says here. That's a long, long haul there, Dwayne. And he, uh, he started working on oceanfront estates in the Hamptons and Long Island, New York. And in 1996, he moved to Charlotte, North Carolina and started a general contracting business with Roger Ketchum. And the two achieved success right away. And they've earned many uh, industry awards and rave reviews from clients, designers, and trade partners. And Dwayne has always been dedicated to elevating professionalism in the construction industry. And he has now shifted his focus from the day-to-day -day aspects of building and remodeling award businesses to building more rewarding and more valuable businesses. He believes the key ingredients to success are continuous learning, strategic planning, collaboration with like-minded peers, and elimination of egos. Tough one there. When he is not talking shop, you will most likely find him outdoors. He and his family love to travel, hike, explore, and discover new places and new things. Please help me welcome Dwayne Johns. Dwayne, thank you for being here. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm glad to be here. And yeah, when you said 30 years ago, that you know that kind of hits hard. You realize that was a long time ago. And then I'm noticing that Dallas Cowboys helmet at the top of your uh yeah. your background there. And that's probably uh -huh. the last time they were really relevant. So <laughs> 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 well, uh, boy, but hey, well, hey, I say it as a as a fan. I was a Dallas Cowboys fan for many, many years. I moved to the Carolinas and, and became a Carolinas Panthers fan. And that's been rough. difficult as well. So anyway, I are feel you your a, pain. Are you a Hornets fan as well? You know, I try to be. I try to. Well, I'm, I'm probably the world's um, most pathetic New York Knicks fan. Um, you know, I still hang on to this day and it is just it's painful. It's extremely painful. 
that one is is right up there with the uh, with the Kings. We've had so much peril, so this is the first time we're in the playoffs, so we're excited. We're playing on the Warriors, and we're we're pretty jazzed about it here in Sacramento. So um, yeah, it got, should be. It's taken over uh, our content, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, thanks so, for having me again, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah no. Anytime, man. I'd, so let's start with your thirty-year career, I, and I'm really kind of interested in that that working in the Hamptons component. I know that that was kind of your start. And what a what a strange start, right? Working with with the mansions and with with uh, you know a different kind of construction. So tell me a little bit about your upbringing in construction. Yeah, it's unique. I mean, I grew up about an hour and a half uh, or close to 100 miles east of New York City uh, in a place called the Hamptons, which is it is beautiful. Um, it's everything you you may have heard about or, or seen when you hear the Hamptons. Um, but it's also one of those places where you've got you know, you've got a lot of luxury and, and vacation homes. And then you've got, you know, the everyday local people. And, and that that's who I was. I mean, I grew up out there, had a family that hell, I think I have family that, that dates back to that area to to the 1600s. Um, and I mean, I, you know, we had family, I had a family of fishermen and people that were also in some of the skilled trades. And as I was going through high school, you know, that was one of the things that I did a lot. It was summer jobs. You know, that's really got me, got, what, what got me exposed to, yeah. to construction. Yeah. Um, and I, I realized that in, as I was getting through the later years of high school, that, you know, college wasn't really for me because I didn't have an idea what I wanted to do. You know, I just I wasn't in a position to just go out and try it for four years. Right. Um, but I was really comfortable with construction. I mean, I was learning a lot of stuff and I had, I had done everything from painting to trim work to cabinetry roofing. I mean, it just I said, hey, I, I, I like what I'm doing. I can make a good buck doing this. Um, and that's where I poured my energy. I was fortunate because, you know, you do get to work on some of just off the charts crazy stuff, you know, right. oceanfront estates. And I mean, I saw craftsmanship at its highest level. So I was fortunate at an early age to get exposed to that, that type of construction, you know, that level of craftsmanship. Right. Um, and I think that that's what gave me an appreciation even more for the trades. And I was one of those people that was always observing, you know, even if I was doing one thing I'm observing, you know, if I, if I'm working on the frame, helping a framing crew, I'm watching what, you know, the, foundation guys are doing and i mean yeah. what are the roofing guys doing what are the trim guys doing uh, mm -hmm. man look at those guys that's just some great cabinet work you know, I've, I've always had an appreciation for all of it yeah and i think that's what led me to um you know i ultimately as i said worked as uh side jobs and then turned into a subcontractor for some some great builders out there um started my own business had moved down here to the carolinas in like 1995 or 96 started a business general contracting business with my still to this day business partner, Roger Ketchum. Um, and just do all things, you know, related to residential construction, custom homes, renovations, um, and went from the guy that was literally hands-on doing it. Yeah. Wearing all the hats through the years, you know, right. Hey, well, right. now I have to stop actually working and, and spend some time on sales and then estimating and then, well, now I need to build systems and processes and, you know, so all the way through to the other end where today I don't really, I'm not that involved with my day-to-day -day construction business, a little bit more on the visionary side, trying to spend time focused on the, you know, the bigger picture, where is the business going, helping to build my team and support my team. So um, right. it's, it's been, it's been a fun journey. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny you talked about the college aspect. It seems like based on what you described, you've been to many different colleges along the way, right? In the beginning, it was the trades and, you know, before you know it, you're learning how to do marketing and sales and, oh my God, it's just, I know the feeling like you just, you, if you never stop learning, you, you're, you can pick up something new and it sounds like that's kind of what you did, huh? That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. All, all along the way, you know, I had, had good folks that I was around mentors that I had learned from. And then of course, you know, the school of hard knocks teaches you probably more than, more than anything. Yeah, the painful ones. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it seems like you have a kind of a common theme, too, that you have always enjoyed giving back to the industry that has given you so much. So where did that come from? I think when I um, this goes back probably to the late 1990s, early 2000s, I really started to get involved with in groups like NARI, uh, NAHB, yeah. um, because there was, you know, I was always one of my beliefs is there's just always a better way, um, yeah. always a better way to do stuff. And this is an industry that that is slow to change, you know, slow to embrace sure. new things. Um, 
And I just I wanted to collaborate and see what other people were doing, you know, and, and we all we all I think anybody that's in this industry also knows that there's a lot of people that and especially 30 years ago, um, yeah. the sharing was not so much. I mean, you always had the one guy, you know, the one right. good builder or one good sure. uh, carpenter that was willing to share everything with you. Yeah. But everybody else was really kind of standoffish. You know, they, right. they it was go to work, do your job. Yeah. Um, and the, the, a lot of fear of competition. And I think that still lives to today, yeah. you know, so I started getting exposed to some of these uh, industry groups and things like that. And, and that just started to connect me with other like minded people. And that's when I realized, hey, the challenge here is for us to elevate ourselves, you know, because the industry it's it's viewed as I've got, I've got a builder friend that says, you know, it's, it's a shame that on the outside looking in, people say, well, when you f when you fail at everything else, go try construction. Um, <laughs> you know, and that's just I've always I've always wanted to fight that. Yeah, uh, the, that perception, you know, to where we can elevate ourselves to be professionals. I mean, all uh, trades and everyone involved in this industry should be elevated to that level of professionalism. So, yeah, anything that I, that I could ever do along the way. I mean, I've learned a lot from others. And if there's anything that I can do along the way to get back, that's that's what I want to do. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's so true that 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 common theme about, you know, I hear it too. Oh, yeah. Go try construction then. And I also have heard what you said, too, about the competition. I think for those folks that, that have that fear of competition, usually they're, they're, they feel like they're on unstable ground themselves. You know, obviously, they have some, some self-esteem issues with themselves personally or their business. Like, hey, I can't give away a secret that could break me. And that just seems like everyone was always thinking that if anybody hears how I'm doing it, they're going to copy me. And I think you're right. You have to get involved with those groups like Nari and NHB to to rub shoulders with like-minded people otherwise typically you're going to run into people who don't want to share any secrets or how they do things yeah for sure yeah, yeah for sure so um you know i mentioned on this podcast and on my uh, on my live show several times that my favorite uh, podcast is the Builder nuggets podcast and i think that i gravitate towards it because your content is very similar to mine like i said it's 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 very important topics you know mental health and and diversity and you know the real issues that are kind of underlying a lot of the other issues in, in construction so i appreciated you and dave young's um genuine i think desire to give back to the industry and i think that's obviously is innate in you that's that's definitely your kind of marching order right now um i also love collaboration over competition i think it's so true um, I, I think you're right that there's always a better way or somebody that can help you do it. Um, why not ask? And so, you know, I, I had a couple questions about that. How did you meet Dave? Um, and I, know, I think you're, you said you're a couple seasons in. I, I imagine you've learned a ton from other owners. And, you know, I guess, you know, you love podcast days. Like, I, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it's all part of this evolution that I, that I've gone through, through the years, you know, I mean, coming out of the downturn in 2008, I, I was really accelerated my, you know, my thought of there's a better way to do this. Sure, um, yeah. I was going to get out of the rat race of bidding and estimating and just spending all kinds of time, um, frankly, doing work and not getting paid for it, you know? Right. Um, yeah. and then also at the same time, looking at how do I, you know, had a good business, have a great reputation, a uh, great client base, but you, you know, you also come to that point of, all right, what am I going to do with this thing when I grow up? You know, right. um, well, what's the longer term plan for my business? You know, am I going to be able to get to a point where I could either sell it or, you know, maybe hand it over to somebody on the team or just create something that wasn't so dependent on me. So through that process, I was just absorbing more and more information. I started to get involved with some entrepreneur groups. I joined a group called Vistage. Um, which was great. It exposed me to lots of business owners outside of the construction industry. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say fast forwarding to like 2015, 16, I was, I was just on this exploration of all the things that I could do to, to, to better my business, you know, yeah. systems, processes, knowledge, all this. And I was approached by Dave Young. Um, and he was with a, a group called Allaire, Allaire Homes, um, mm -hmm. that was actually uh, founded in Canada. Um, and they were looking to expand into the U S and, they needed, they were looking for someone to partner up with to open up a market in, in the Carolinas. Um, and at first I was, I wasn't sure, you know, I mean, I, I, I was open-minded enough to have the conversation, but I just wasn't sure. And, and mostly because I just didn't know what it was. Right. Um, but as I dug deeper in, I realized that this is a pretty cool concept. It's a, 
you know, a, a network of builders, remodelers, very successful builders and remodelers um, that really had a very like mindset. They're convinced that, man, there's a better way to do stuff. And a lot of it is based on consolidation. You know, like, hey, if we if we get together and settle on um, a way to share maybe core services like accounting and payroll and marketing, branding, training, um, man, that's a solve for all of us. It's something that, you know, now we don't have to worry about trying to figure that out for a business and then we can collaborate together um, share it, make it stronger. So anyway, it was, it was intriguing to me. We went through, um, an exploratory process, joined Allaire. Um, and through that, I was also offered an opportunity to become a regional partner with Allaire. So I still own my business in Charlotte, yeah. a construction business with Roger. Um, but I also now work to recruit other builders and remodelers that might be interested in what we're doing and also act in a support role, um, almost like a business coach for them to help them grow their teams, um, and it's, it's just, it's a great culture, you know? So, so through that, it's allowed me to get exposed to other, lots of other builders, remodelers, other industry leaders, um, yeah. business coaches, consultants. And I've been able to go through the steps necessary to get myself to a point where I was not, I didn't have to be so involved in my business on a daily basis. Right. And of course, one of the things that I've wanted to do, uh, for a while is to kind of spread the message a little bit. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, for me, it's troubling that so many people can put 25, 30 years or more in this industry and not have a whole lot at the end, you know? Yeah. Maybe they, they made a good living, um, have some great work and things to look back on, but then they, they really, their options are generally like close the doors. You know, we're finding that children or, you know, or don't really want the business anymore. Um, yeah. nobody, nobody really rides along, just comes up, knocks on your door and strokes you that big check to buy your business, you know? So it's, <laughs> it's kind of sad that a lot of these businesses just, like I said, they just kind of shut the doors and, and it goes away. And, um, I was convinced there's a, there's just a, better way to, to approach this. And that's really where the concept of the podcast came from. You know, we were, Dave and I said, Hey, what if we could take all the things that, that we have learned plus bring on other guests and share the knowledge of the people that have managed to pull it off. You know, the right. people that have gotten to a point where they have really a truly successful business, you know, yeah, um, right. and as the title says, the ideal business. And, and that's different for everybody. I mean, for some people it's, it's pure up monetary gain for others. It's freedom. It's time. Right. Um, and that's, you know, that's really where it came to be. So we've, and it was pretty quickly into the podcast, probably by our, I would say maybe our eighth or 10th episode that we were just blown away by, um, how much others were willing to share. You know, we're talking about other builders, other, right. you know, business coaches. We've had people outside the industry come on. I think I've used, you've found one thing that I've found through this yeah. is that, you know, at first it seemed extremely daunting to do something like this, but. Um, you give people an opportunity to talk about themselves and they'll, they'll have at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're right. That there's so much to that. Um, I think it's, it's great what you guys are doing because I struggle with this myself being the third generation, like trying to look ahead and, and be the visionary for our business. And I, I struggle with it because I do get bogged down and I, I do get lost and I go, Holy shit, that was a year. Like what happened to that whole year? I was going to yeah. do X, Y, and Z that year. And then you just push it to the next year and you do almost need a mentor because if you don't have somebody that can help kind of guide you through these steps, I do think our industry is set up to lose multiple years and decades without you even yeah. blinking. And, and it, I, I do think our industry is that kind of set up that way. We're used to putting out the fires and, you know, you have an idea when you go into your day, what you want to do and sure as shit, you know, two minutes later you get a call and you're, you're going to do something else that day. Yeah. And so I think you really need to figure out a way to manage your time, right? I mean, that's got to be step one with this whole process. It's time. It's, um, you know, there's there's a lot to it. And, and again, I think most of us that go into this industry go into it because we have a passion for some part of it, whether it's the actual craft, you know, whether it's seeing things come to life, a remodel, a custom home. Right. Um, and the business side always comes secondary. You know, yeah. we, we haven't really gone through maybe formal business school, business training. Right. Right. Um, so we, we spend a lot of time playing catch up, you know, patching the pieces together. Oh, I, I need this new and improved system. Or what am I going to do for software? How am I going to, you know, have an onboarding plan? And I've got to grow my business. And um, so much time is spent. The urgency is always 
today or tomorrow. Right. You know, like, oh, where's the, I've got a lumber delivery tomorrow. And I got to make sure it's in the right spot. Oh, you know, I got a phone call. The port of John got delivered to the wrong side of the street. I mean, right. You know, that's the urgent stuff right. where we need to get ourselves to the point where we're focusing on the important stuff. You know, the important stuff is, is generally some of that longer term stuff. You know, what kind of things do I need to be doing to think about my business six months, a year, five years from now? So, right. And right. most of us, most of us simply spend little to no time on that. Yeah. And I think for me, you know, and I, I know a lot of people are in my boat. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a control freak, right? So um, I don't love handing over big pieces of business to others. I have a hard time with it because I know how I would do it. And I know that it's a family business. And I know like, oh man, if I hand that over and they screw it up, then, you know, you're going to get a crappy review. Or, like something's going to happen. So I think for me, um, I struggle with that aspect of like, I need to be able to replace myself. And you know, struggled with how to, how to do that, you know? So like, I need a, a strategy session on just replacing me, please. <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, it's getting it out of your head and getting it somewhere yeah. where other people can understand it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and I mean, I think starting with that, like, what does building your ideal business mean to you? Cause I think, like you said, it's different for everybody. It's different for everybody. Um, you know, something for me that really over the last couple of years, uh, has, has really resonated with me. And it's something that I said, wow, that was kind of like the, the two by four upside the head moment was I, I realized that, you know, as, as a business owner and, and as, as leaders, you know, we, where we should be spending the vast majority of our time is creating opportunities for other people. Right. You know, I spent so much time building my business. And as you said, just the weeds and just that stuff that I, I always felt and uh, granted it's important, but it wasn't really moving the needle um, in the bigger picture. And then as I've gotten to that point, like I said, where I've built a pretty good, uh, well, uh, incredibly good and talented team. Um, I don't, I don't worry about that stuff anymore. You know, the day-to-day -day stuff is kind of taken care of. I, I can, I'm comfortable in letting them make those decisions. Do they stumble? Do they fall down sometimes? Sure they do. Yeah. Um, but what I've found is when I give, and it has to be the right people, don't go, don't get me wrong. But once you, once you have a core group of good people around you, now I've, I've shifted my energy to what, what's the next opportunity I can create for them. You know, if I see somebody that has the potential to, to grow, right. That's just going to come back to me at some point down the road, right. um, you know, tenfold. Right. Uh, and, and that's, it, for me, that's, what's been exciting is to watch other people go through transformations, people that you know, but maybe were challenged or kind of had that scarcity mindset around they couldn't do this or they, man, I don't know how I could do that. Or no, I could never, you know, run my own business or, or whatever the case, you know, by, but by being able to give them opportunities, that's, I mean, to me, I think that's what really makes a, uh, an ideal business, you know, is you can start to put, put team members and people in place to where they just do it better than you ever could. Um, right. Right. That was our topic last last month was, you know, investing in someone, bringing someone from the job site to the office. You know, what does that look like? But it's investing time into people. And I think for so many, for me, generations, it's usually you keeping people under your thumb. And it's usually, um, you know, you don't want to you don't want them to be better than you. You just want them to do their job. You want them to you don't really want to even say they're doing a good job. You just want them to just keep their head down and keep going. But like you said, if you don't take the time to invest in them, then they're just a commodity. Then they're just a commodity. Yeah. It's just the money. It's then they're going to get picked off by somebody else. And you've messed up. Basically is what happened. Yeah. And, and you know, when you come together like that as a team, you hear us on our podcast, we'll talk a lot about freedom. That's something we talk about building freedom. What we mean by that is, you know what? An ideal business is, is getting you to a position. I like to look at it as options. You know, I mean, that that freedom gives you freedom of time. You know, maybe that just creates more time for you and other members on your team, the freedom to do other stuff, um, the financial freedom, um, freedom to, you know, kind of change on the dime things that you're looking at. The team might come together and say, hey, we want we need to move in a different direction here because we see something changing in the market. Right. Whereas if you if you don't have those freedoms built in, you're beholden to everything. Right. You know. Um, and then it becomes very inflexible. And I think that's where a lot of the stress comes in. Um, and it's just not fun, you know? So, so yeah, it's different, you know, that what the ideal business is different for everybody, but for me, one that is creates those freedoms 
which will inevitably become more valuable. Right. You know, it's right. just setting you up to where you have options in your business. Um, you may never ever sell it. You may never want to sell it. But if you've got right. your business to the point where you could sell it, right. that's, that's not- pretty healthy. Yeah. So I imagine, I mean, the biggest challenge that we're talking about here is getting getting the business owner to just start to strategically think about what is your ideal business, right? Because so many of us, maybe they don't know, or maybe maybe it's just like, maybe it's something in the recess of your brain that, oh yeah, but that's for retirement years, you know? Um, but like getting them to think about it, because then you can't, you can't set yourself up to be in a position to make that a reality when the time comes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I- and that's why I challenge a lot of people when I, I, I talk to them, especially people that are early on starting their business. You know, I kind of ask them, why did you why did you go into business? Um, and one of my favorite quotes, I've heard it from a few people, but, you know, as entrepreneurs, uh, you know, entrepreneurs will work 80 hours a week to avoid working 40. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. that's just so true, you know, but and that, that's what we do. We, we don't want to go back to the job so to speak. We want that freedom. We want to be able to make our own decisions. We want, but we also get into that hamster wheel, you know, and before we know it, we start to say, well, why did I go into business in the first place? You know, so I challenge everybody to really put a lot of effort into that. You know, think about what is, what's the whole point of the business? Um, Where are you taking it? What is it going to do for you? You know, what do you want out of this business 10, 20, 30 years from now? It's so much easier to build towards that than to go the other way and then try to figure that out in the last few years. Right. I think that's you know, where most of us fall in that last, that last section. And, you know, yeah. and we, you talked about it before, why is having a vision so important? You know, a vision is, that's really where, you, where you're going. You know, I like to look at it as, you know, if you packed everybody on a bus or on a train, I mean, you know, what, what would you do if you had no idea where you're going, you know? Right. Um, right. And that's, and there's various ways to do that different exercises. You'll hear, hear us talk a lot about, EOS, the entrepreneur operating system, big proponents of that. I got exposed to that probably about 10 years ago. Um, It's a great suite of tools that just walks you through vision and core values and living in the 90 day world, you know, having very specific rocks and goals. Um, But the vision, I think, is what's so important about that is there's no way you're ever going to get people to you hear the term buy-in all the time. You'll never get buy-in for people if they have no idea what, what where they're going. Right. You know, and if you're right. kind of the kind of owner that just is head down and coming to work every day, expecting everybody to just do their job. Right. That's just going to lead to a lot of frustration, you know, right. but when you bring the team together and they clearly understand where we're going um, and that, you know, that could be, again, that's different for everybody, but you know, maybe the team knows that, Hey, Hey, this year we're doing a million dollars. We're going to do $3 million right. next year. I want to be a $5 million or $10 million company in five years. And then, you know what? By 20 years, we're going to have multiple locations. And now, sometimes that kind of thinking scares people because, again, it's back to that scarcity mindset, you know? Right. Sure, sure. But think think of how much that empowers your team. You know, if you've got a team that's starting to say, wow, this is where we're going. I right. want to be a part of that. You know, I want to – I know that we're, we're talking about working towards a company that – um you know, is creating that freedom of time for all of us. You know, there's opportunities. I could have the, an opportunity to be invested in this business. Again, whatever that looks like for everybody, but having a vision of where you're going with the business is just, yeah. there's no doubt it's one of the most important things there is. Um, Do you without, recommend- it, you're, without it, you're just coming to work every day. Yeah, oh, 100%. Do you recommend having uh, whatever this looks like as a team, like, is this a, is this a retreat scenario where you're really open to feedback or are you coming in as a business owner? Like, this is our vision. You, just, you know what I mean? Cause that's, yeah, I think, happen, right? yeah. Well, there's a couple of different ways to look at it. Cause in, in one case it can be difficult if, if you're, if you're a small team, if you're just, if it's just yourself or maybe just you and one other person, that can be a little difficult to go through deep exercises like this. Right. Um, but the concepts are still the same. Right. Um, but if you do have any, any sort of team, yeah, I do encourage people to, to go through it as a, as a team exercise. Um, one of the things you might want to consider doing first is maybe even having a, some sort of personality profile or assessment done on, on everyone. I, I'm a big fan of Colby, K O L B E Colby assessments. Um, it's very clear, but what, what they'll do is it'll quickly let you know what type of personality you are, you know, cause 
some people are visionaries. They're they're yeah. big time visionaries. They can see into the future. They don't need a lot of information. They have a great idea. They're going to run with it. Others are not. They're just right. not visionary thinkers at all. Right. You know. Right. And if you're if you're not a visionary, you're going to have a really tough time painting a picture for the future of your business. So in that case, you might need a little help. You know. Right. Um, something like EOS, you can you can self implement. There's tools on the website to do that, but they also have like. Uh, professional implementers, you know, people you could bring in as a third party to your company to help you go through this exercise of identifying, you know, what your mission and vision are, core values. And um, what's cool, though, about doing it as a group is that you're not. And this is where that ego thing comes in that I talk about. I mean, I don't I don't ultimately now I don't want this to be my vision. Truthfully, right. I want this to be the teams coming together. And, you know, we have these healthy conversations around what is important to us what's going to make a, a better business and uh, a shared vision that you know everybody's vested in it right yeah i think it goes a big one i especially in construction i think it you know a lot of us business owners have a big chip of it and you know maybe that's maybe that's the hustle to get where we got or or maybe that's partly because we have a lot of pride in the work we do and like we see this from beginning to end and to completion. And there's like just a lot of ego involved. And I get it. I think a, a little slice of that is healthy, but um, I think getting people to put your ego aside and look at it as a team is, is difficult for a lot of folks. And we're at a generational change too. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of gen X a little bit in the middle, but um, yeah. you know, let's face it. A lot of our future workforce is going to be millennials and, and gen Z and, um, I can't remember where I was. I might've been at, a, at an HBA function or something. And there was an, there was an older person that said, uh, oh, you know, the, the millennials don't want to work. They don't want to work. They don't want to work. And then <laughs> one of the young folks chimed in and said, oh yeah, well maybe they don't want to work for you. <laughs> you know, and it, that was, it was, it was perfect. Cause perfect. it's like, wait, you know, okay. That, that might've been the case years ago. You know, it, right. really the mentality of just come to work, shut up, do your job. Right. Um, th those days are gone. Right. You know, I mean, talented people, which are going to be harder and harder to find in this industry. Right. right. They don't they don't want a job. They right. want they want to be able to come to come come to work, so to speak, but ha have a career where they know they're a part of something. You know, right. they're, they're doing this every day for some bigger reason. I mean, right. if you're not providing or helping them understand what that is, you're going to really struggle to, to hold on to talent. Yeah, I mean, I think that brings us right into the core value piece because I'm with you. I, I'm a, you know, I understand that the millennials had kind of got themselves a bad name in a lot of ways from the from getting their hands dirty kind of work, which is fine. But you're right. If they don't have something to work for, too, like as a as a business, you know, that's partly vision, partly core value of like, hey, what are we doing as a as a business? Are we are we giving back? Are we? Are we not at all? Is that is that part of your business? Because I know a lot of millennials that, that won't work for somebody if they don't believe the core values. If they don't yeah. believe that part, they're not going to apply. Like so, not even to have that as a business is like it's 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 bad. But also, they don't understand how important it is for them. It's money is not as important as the whole picture together. Yeah, no, no doubt. I mean, core values is one of the after the vision to really the core values is the thing that I, I I equate it to your belief, you know, as a, whether that's a business owner or even a team member um, it's kind of the guiding light, the guiding principles for the company. Yeah. And that too, you know, you'll come around as a team to establish these um, and you got to go a little bit deeper. I mean, you can't, it can't just be, Oh yeah. You know, honesty, integrity, craftsmanship. I mean, I'm, it's on everybody's website in this business. Right. But dive a little bit deeper into what are those those core beliefs um and what happens then is it's it also starts to make every decision you make as a team a lot easier like if you're going to hire somebody new and that's all you have to do is run this person really up against your core values if it right. if it doesn't fit well there's your decision right um almost all the other decisions that you're going to make these decisions that a lot of times you struggle with if you've got a really defined set of core values um that's going to really help Help you make a decision right yeah i mean and, I, my team it's it's marching order right like so like you said like you you put it in front of their, your marching order and if it doesn't fit then yeah you, you're you're going down the wrong path yeah and it also it it it, it, it attracts 
good people, the kind of people that that you want, but it also repulses the ones you don't. Right. You know, um, right. why go through the pain of finding that out six months or a year later if you've got a strong set of core values that you're talking about early on, even when you're hiring someone, right. you know, they might they might just get up and leave the interview. Well, that's right. OK. You know, yeah. so. better find out now. Right. <laughs> better to find out now. Yeah. 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 OK. So uh, on to the next part that you you talk about is the the highest and best use. What do you mean by highest and best use? That, too, is something that. Uh, in in the EOS world, they call it. There's an exercise they call delegate and elevate. Um, and I've seen several other types of uh, exercises like this. But in a sense, it, it means really focusing on the things that you love to do and you're good at. You know, um, and in in the delegate and elevate de delegate and elevate exercise, you know, it's kind of got four quadrants, and on the top left will be things that things that you don't like to do and things that you're not good at. You know, and it works its its way all the way down to the bottom right, which is things that you love to do and you are good at. And, you know, ultimately, that's where you want to be spending your time. And that's all of us, not just as a business owner, but I mean, all team members. You, sh you should be getting to the point where the vast major majority of your time is spent doing the things that you love and the things that you're really good at. And I think too many of us get stuck somewhere else, you know, because we feel yeah. like we're the only ones that can do it. Um, it's also why... Um, it's also why people get frustrated. I think a, a lot of times as business owners, it's the do it yourself mindset. Right. But what's, if you look back, it's generally because we probably didn't set that person up for success in the first place. Right. You know, if you're looking at stuff as just handing it off, like I just got to get this off my plate. Right. Here's good, do, do A, B and C. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then it comes back to you in worse shape than when you gave it to them, you know, <laughs> now you've got twice as much work. Right. So that's, you, you know, you kind of recoil from that and you go, man, I'm just not going to do this. I'll just do it myself. It's easier if I just do it myself. I mean, how many times do you hear that? How many times have you said that? I've said it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah but as you go through that exercise and start to get really embrace that mindset of delegating and elevating people, you know, you, you, you finding your highest and best use. So, and every, every individual needs to go through that exercise to understand what that is. You know, um, yeah. I, I'm not big on, I understand. And I, I know the value of systems and processes, mm -hmm. but boy, I don't like designing them. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sit there and create, if, if I had to create a, you know, standard operating procedure. I, it's just like eating worms for me. I can't do it. Right. I don't want right. to do it. I'm slow. It's probably going to be difficult for anybody else to understand. Right. So I need to find somebody else that does that. Find somebody right. else that loves, I, I, I call it like the eating your kale. You know, somebody will eat your kale. Somebody loves it. They'll take as much as you can give them. Right. Um, so yeah, that's really the whole point of, of highest and best use is when you can get to that point where everyone on your team has found their highest and best use and they're focused on it. Right. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's night and day when it comes to attitude and performance and everything else. Yeah. How do they, because I don't, I imagine not everyone knows what they do love. Right. You know? Yeah. So like, I think you get, like you said, you get pigeonholed. I, I use that like athletes a lot. Right. So, you know, you get a kid that's good at playing catcher and, uh, you know, pretty much the, he plays catcher the entire time, but that's not what he loves to do. But you right. get kind of like you're pigeonholed into a spot and like you're good at it, right? So everyone just assumes, oh, he must like doing that. But maybe you don't even know that you hate it, for one. And like maybe you don't even know what you would be good at or love to do because you've never done an analysis yeah. like this. Yep. Right? And it's another it's it's another great team exercise to do together, you know, to, right. to just jot it down, just list. And a good way to start is to even think, just start writing down all the things you do in a given day. You know, just right. write them down and then maybe right. go back through that list and start to check. Do I like it? Do I love it? You know, do I not right. like it? Am I good at it? Am I not good at it? Right. Um, like me, I'm, I'm really good at at obtaining building permits. I can't stand it. I, I don't want to do it. So there's again, there's a perfect example. If, if I had to do a lot of that, I my battery would be drained. I'd be exhausted by, you know, right. noon each day and. Right. Um, so I need to find somebody else to do that, you right. know? Um, right. so go through, yeah, go through all the different tasks that you do. Um, another good way to look at it is to even take a, tell, tell each member of your team to just take a notepad or something and maybe even do that for a week, 
you know, just yeah. next week, just jot down all the things that you do. Or if you think of something that you just don't like doing, jot it down and then get together again. Like I said, as a team to find right. out what you like doing and not doing. Now we all know that there's certain things that you just have to, you got to sure. hunker down. You have to do it. It has to get done. I get that. But the point is to over time, get yourself out of doing those things and find somebody else that loves it. Right. So. And so for, for those that are like, uh, that that are out there that are in the smaller business uh, setting, you know, I know this is a, a tough subject because we don't have a big team. Right. So, you know, you do have to wear those multiple hats. So it would become the discussion of, well, do you want to get to a certain level? If you do, then you do have to hire in order to take some of that, those things away. Or like you said, maybe their vision is not, maybe their vision is like, they just want to have a, a decent career and they're okay with like, just shutting the door and and walking away and that's okay. Yeah. I, I just don't know a lot of people that are are okay with that when you say that out loud. Right. And you know, it's also you have to also understand there's a lot of these things that especially in today's world, you know, of there are so many things that can be done on a fractional basis. You know, you can get people that will do um bookkeeping and yeah, uh, blog writing and just I mean sure they're all over. You know, yeah. all of the stuff and in virtual and you don't have to invest tons in it. And they're good at what they do, really good right. at what they do. Right. Right. You just have to find those people. So it doesn't mean you you would have to know. You might come down with a list of, say, administrative things, you know, that maybe takes four hours, eight hours out of your week. Right. Well, find somebody from I'm a, on a part time or like I said, or on a fractional or contract basis to do that. Right. They love it. That's what they they want to do. Sixty hours a week of that. because right. They love it so much. Um that's an easy way to get it off your plate without you making the investment of, Oh, I got to bring in a full-time person and, you know, create a, a job description and all that. I mean, it, it's probably not, doesn't warrant that. So I, I think you have to look at it through the lens that there, there are a lot of options today for some of those fractional type services. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it brings me kind of this last one here where, you know, why do so many of us struggle with this, this subject in general, you know, building your ideal business while preserving our valuable time we all struggle with it. It seems like. So why is that? You think? I, I think a lot of it is because we, we haven't necessarily gone through exercises like we just talked about, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's so it's just, it's almost instinctive to just go back to the fire. You know, this is, I've got to get this done. I have to do this. This is important for tomorrow. And we never really, and what we do is we end up piling more of that stuff on our plate. As long as we can fill ourselves with 50 hours a week of that, we're busy. Um, where we have to become very disciplined around our, our time management, you know, right. and you have to make sure that you're, you've heard the, the cliche, you know, working on the business, not in the business, but it's, it's true. You know, you look at any successful entrepreneur, any successful business, they, it's either that on that business owner, or they've got a leadership team dedicated to doing that. They're working on the business. Right. Um, and maybe you need to get yourself around other people that are doing that. Uh, to me, I think that that's something that is transformative is because it, it's hard to gather that information and actually figure it out on your own, you know, right. and that's when you get frustrated with it, but immerse yourself Get get in a room with other people, a mastermind, we like to call it, you know, people that have done it. And it doesn't have to be in this industry um, because a lot of what we're talking about really is simple business sense. Right. Um, and that, that was something for me about 10 years ago, too, that was eye opening is, you know, is that I started to and I'd heard it from a few others. But, you know, started to look at myself as I said, I said, hey, at, at some point here, I have to start looking at myself as a business owner first. Right. And I just happen to be engaged in construction. Sure. And that's sure. really, really hard for us. Right. You know, because it's for most of us, it's construction first. It's the trade first. It's that it's that's first. Right. And everything else comes after that. Right. Um, and it doesn't mean if you switch your mindset to business first, some people will think, oh, man, that means I'm going to give up quality or I'm not going to. Like you said before, I'm afraid now I'm letting go of stuff. I'm not going to be touching it. Right. That's not the case. If you if you really dedicate yourself to thinking that way thinking of of this is a business the business needs the attention first right you know it needs the right people the right parts pieces systems processes all that all that other stuff will work itself out right um but you'll you'll be at an exercise you know you'll drive yourself mad if all you do is start trying stuff 
Yeah. You know, without having all that other foundational stuff in place first. You know? Right. Well, and, and I think that's it. That's where the frustration comes in. Somebody heard about something, yeah, totally. they tried it, it went sideways, and then oh, I'm not doing that again. Exactly. I can I, I can picture yeah. it right now. <laughs> yeah. So in your consultant side of your your business, do you get um, involved with helping teams get set up with something like this? We do. We we will talk to folks and take them through um, a little uh, a bit of a business assessment that we have. I mean, and again, everybody's different. You know, we've got people that are just starting out and they might be doing a very slow, low volume all the way up to people that are large volume looking to looking to scale, grow. Um, sure. And we try to understand we try to paint a picture of where they are today. Right. You know, and, and look back at what have um, obviously some of the core fundamentals of the business but we'll dive into things like have you had any formal coaching are you involved in industry groups sure. you know what kind of collaboration do you do and because we want to peel the onion a little bit to find out who it is we're dealing with you know sure. some people i mean some people are have just not done any of that and they, they they've never been exposed to it you know and all right. they all they really need is to get a little bit of that exposure um I, we've had some folks that that's that's really all it took was an, some exposure to a few industry groups or a mastermind or two and their business was just changed night and day right right you know? yeah i think that's you know maybe the people who need to hear this the most are the ones that aren't, aren't going to take the time to watch right um or to yeah. do because they are going to get bogged down but you know you just hope that you have that like mentor or friend that can can push you in the right direction whether that's a vistage group or whether that's a mastermind group or whether that's Nari or NAHB or just Nari NAHB, you yeah. got Remodelers Advantage, and you've got Builder Twenty groups. There's all sorts of stuff out there. I know, it's, it's, or yeah, yeah, or maybe it's it's pushing to to someone to know. Like like now, I know you that you you help with stuff like this, so I'm going to be able to push people in your direction. I think this is one that honestly I hear so often as a, as a common struggle for us, and I imagine it it is a little bit unique to construction because of uh, of the way we enter business usually. You know, like you said, we don't enter through a typical channel. We're not entering through a business school usually or, you know, a lot of times it's like, oh, crap, I'm going to just go take my contractor's license, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then uh, before you know, you get back, back in the mail and you're like, well, I guess I've got a business now. <laughs> and then you just, yeah, you figure it out as you go. And, and that and that is that's what we do. We build stuff. We figure it out. And we figure it out. We figure yeah. it out. We're, we're the best in the world at doing that. But I think that that is also a struggle because there's a lot to figure out. And like, especially with with businesses, like you just think of like, just think of the tax code and think of a PPP and ERC and all this shit that's coming at you. You're like that. That's, there's so much to think. There's about. so much. Yeah. Right. And there's only again, that's back to the time thing. I think the time probably is the most valuable of all the things out there is time. Right. Um, and what what you do with it is the most important. Right. You know, because right. we're again, a lot of us are just it's inherent in us to just, well, if I do a little more, you know, if I work a little harder. Right. Um, eh, that's <laughs> that that can be an endless loop. Right. So how do you recommend on that time management piece? Is it is it? you know, uh, at the end of the day, take two hours, shut your phone off and like, we'll go through this series of steps to, to be able to get in the right direction or what, what does that look like for a lot of folks? You know, for me, something that was, and this goes back almost 20 years ago. Um, I really, I was exposed to a time blocking, I guess it was like a seminar. I can't remember what it was. I think it was through some, uh, builder function, but somebody came in and really talked about time blocking at a very high level. Um, and I, I think that's when I, and when I look at people's schedules and, and I can just sometimes see people that the chaos that they're living in, um, on a day-to-day -day basis and, and every, everyone else has control of their schedule except them. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really hard and people don't quite understand or, or what I'll see too is people will grasp the concept and again, the whole concept of time blocking is you have some very specific things set on your calendar um, that you're going to do. You know, all right, I've got two hours carved out on Thursday for, you know, working on my sales process or whatever. Yeah. Um, where it falls short is people block the time, but then they don't protect it. Ooh. They easily go, oh, yeah, I'll run out there and meet with that client or go do this. Or they just they something else. Again, that urgency trumps the importance. Yeah. I think you know. you're talking to me on that last one. It's yeah. hard. It's hard. I can, but yeah, I, I can walk the things out and I have these yeah. great 
to do lists and organize organizing. But yeah, I mean, it's that phone call that I picked up and then it's the thought that I need to do it right the second, that kind of thing. And it's retraining yourself and it's training folks around you. I mean, when I first started doing it, I just, I wasn't taking calls from, from certain people, some of my project managers and site managers. I mean, I, I had to get it to the point where if it's not on fire, don't call me. Right. Um, and yeah, okay, there was a few rough patches in in the beginning, but you know what? It got to the point where they understood, hey, if, if you've got the information, if you've got access to figure this information out, I'm going to support you in making that decision. Right. But right. I, I had to, like I said, for the longest time, they would just come to me, come to me, come to me. And, right. and, and the worst thing, one of the worst to me, inventions in, in, in our industry was the, you remember the push to talk Nextel? Oh. oh. There was no bigger distraction in this industry ever. Nobody oh would even God. stop to think about something. They'd just push that button. Oh, hey, do that... you have, do you know how can I, where is, you know, uh, that's, and you have that, that's the kind of stuff you have to shut off. You have to block time for you to work on these things in your business and yeah. then protect it. Just don't let people violate it. You know, you have to say no. Do you know what's getting in pretty close to second is texting though, because yeah, it is. And now, it really that, is. And now you even have foremans with a, a smartwatch or an Apple watch. And you're like, why are you looking at your text right now? You're on a ladder. Like, is it that important? But like, they feel like everything's so important. Like that text comes in, like we have to answer it. Yeah. It's kind of like the push talk crap. It's annoying. Yep. And it's, it's annoying. distracting people and it like makes you when you're talking to someone, it makes them divert their eyes down. And yeah. you're like, you're not talking, you're not listening to me right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's but, something you have to work. You have to work on it yourself and you have to work yeah. on it with your teams. You have to always be thinking about moving to how do I we become a more proactive team versus reactive? You know, I mean, most of us are reactive. That's that's kind of the, the world we live in. And I, I get it. This industry does have its surprises. We know that. But yeah. you can limit those by being really proactive. You know, if you're having good team meetings, maybe a, one thing we have every week is, is just kind of a kickoff meeting, a Monday morning kickoff. Everybody knows what they're doing, where they're going, what kind of resources do we need? Right. That saves a lot of those random phone calls during the week. You right. Know? Right. Um, yeah. Good point. Good point. Well, I mean, a, a couple of last things here. I mean, I know you're you wear many hats. I mean, a lot of your hats are on the more strategic and, and doing things like this side, you know, podcast or consultant, speaker, advocate, builder. You know, what gets you out of bed the quickest in the morning these days with all those, those hats you're wearing? I would say now it's working with new new teams. Like I have, you know, fortunately working with Alaire, I have um, the opportunity, like I said, to bring on uh, some some new business owners um, and, the, and their teams. And, and that time I spend with them to really understand their business, what they've done over the last five years, 10 years or more. Um, helping them solve a lot of things we just talked about today, you know, is, is there, they've got a good business, but there's some pieces missing. They can't quite connect all the dots. They want to get to the next level. Right. Um, how do they, how do they, and helping them figure that out. Yeah. And awesome. yeah, you know, what I love about it is by doing things the right way, by going through some of these exercises I talked about is these, you're actually empowering these folks to, to ultimately figure it out on their own. Not like I don't come in and tell people what to do. Right. You know, right. um, I try to give them the tools and some of the knowledge from my experiences of, of how they can come to those conclusions on their own. It's really cool to watch. You know, yeah. it's great to watch team teams get out of their own way, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, Cause everybody, if you hear that talked about with business owners a lot, like business owners get stuck or business owners are in their way. I, it's, I, I've found that almost everybody on, on a team is sort of in their own way, you know? Um, right. Because they do, they have to, they have to go through some of these things and understand what, what gets them up in the morning, right. you know, until, right. until everybody, until everybody really goes through that and then understands it sure. as a team. Um, yeah. So that's what, that's what fires me up. Cool. Awesome. And then one last thing on that, on the Alaire thing, I, I, I've seen some really cool write-ups on, on kind of that franchise model and. Honestly, the more you talk about it, the, the way you're talking about it, it just makes so much sense for a lot of folks. So, I mean, I think that that's something that a lot of people should look at is how, how do you pull resources together like Alara has done and and make some of these giant hurdles that are in our way? You know, just think of like the insurance component and like you said, payroll, all these like things yeah. that are decisions that we have to make, changes we make, you know, through the years. 
and how much time it takes. Um, to me, that's that's the probably the, the most attractive part of that, right? Is that yeah. let's just take some of your time away so that you can invest it in in the big business part of it. Um, because I, I don't know it, that's part of what bogs us down is just the, those, those day-to-day decisions too. Yeah. It's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting business model. And, um, what, what I think is, is most powerful about it. It's the tough, it's the tough part to explain. It's the culture, but the culture comes from what we're, from what we're doing. It's just an incredible group of people. Yeah. Um, and it's like anything else. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things out there that you can explore and, and learn about, um, you know, to, to, to better yourself and better your business. Right. Um, this is just another one, you know? And I right. mean, certainly if anybody wants to reach out to me, I can, I can, um, let them know more about it, but yeah, I, you know, really what, what we're, what we've done is it's the, it's the consolidation play is the big thing, you know, because you look across all industries out there, um, the automaking industry, I mean, you know, chain stores, lumber yards, that they're the every business out there has consolidated to some form or fashion, but that has not happened in residential construction. It just doesn't happen. Right. Um now that doesn't mean you have to be gobbled up by some big entity, you know, and uh, right. it, but what it does mean is you you can start to utilize some of those benefits and powers of of a bigger team and that's what we've done you know we've gotten together and said hey if we bring the best and brightest together and we just share our knowledge as much as we can yeah and then share some common as i said core things behind the scenes right you know i mean at the end of the day we all know we need really really good accounting we want more than bookkeeping we don't all just want to flounder around trying to figure out how to f- use our quickbooks program we, we want world-class accounting right but that's hard to do maybe for any one-off company but if if together you know we say hey let's share this service and support this service that's that's powerful we do that with all you know a lot of the other core services within the business so it just allows it allows us as business owners to focus on the things that we think are important which is you know building relationships and and then building custom homes or or renovations you know so yeah by the collaboration is is off the charts with a, with the layer and it solves a lot of those things that people are out there trying to do all the time you know find yeah. a new system find a new process develop this yeah. grow my team training right um i like i equate it to you know I, when i was looking at it and considering and i said you know i would rather use the mousetrap than spend my time building the mousetrap yeah 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 so well said it was well, frustrating for me that's something that really was frustrating me it was yeah. know, trying to just trying to assemble all the parts and pieces and it was just yeah Crazy. Yeah. It's like going to shop Ikea and <laughs> yeah, be a business. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I, so how do people get a hold of you best? Um, Dwayne, if they want to talk about a layer, they want to talk about your consulting work. Um, the, what- the best way, the easiest way is probably is probably to find me through the, the builder nuggets platform. Um, okay. You can go to builder nuggets.com and it's got all okay. the information about the podcast. Plus it's got my bio and contact information on there. Okay. Um, builder nuggets on Facebook, Instagram, and, you know, wherever you listen to podcasts as well. So awesome. I, I, well, as I'm a big fan, I have been for a long time. Thank you for, for what you do for the industry and for the time that you invest doing things like this. I'm um, getting people to the next level um, of, of success, not only in business, but really just life, like making people happier in our industry. So for, for that, I, I thank you. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Jeremy. Yep. And uh, also I want to thank you. Cause I know as a, uh, I know, I know what goes into doing this, um, yeah. a lot of effort behind the scenes. Um, yeah. And yeah, so just you're, you're providing a valuable, a valuable platform out there for a lot of people. So thank you for what you're doing. All right. Thank you. All right, man. Take care. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in another episode of construction executives live. We will be back next uh, month. It'll be the first Wednesday of the month, 10 AM Pacific time. And you'll be seeing an invite from me here very shortly. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Bye.